gives me immense pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Um, Kasia Yachtov is Professor of Linguistics and Philosophy, well, most of you will know this, but I'll tell everybody. Uh, Linguistics and Philosophy of Language at the University of Cambridge and Professor of Berlin at Newnham College. Um, her research and teaching interests span semantics, pragmatics, and philosophy, and it just so happens that she has this brand spanking new book out <laughs> called Semantics, Pragmatics, and Philosophy. So I'm going to hand this around, so pass this around, so please um, uh, look through it uh, for your delectation and notice so that you can rush out and buy one. Uh, so, um, she's, so in addition to this hot off the press, she's, um, she's um, author of many books um, but, uh, and, and over 100 research articles, and she's edited and co-edited 12 volumes, including the Cambridge Handbook of uh, Pragmatics. Um, and in 2012, she was elected member of Academia Europei, and in 2015, alumnus VIP uh, from the University of Watch. And she, uh, so you can explore more about her on her website, and I'm sure you can find that. Uh, so, without further ado, I will introduce her talk, which is there. So, without further ado, over to you, Kasia. Okay, thank you very much, Susan. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming here on a Saturday uh, afternoon. Uh, this uh, talk is going to be probably somewhat unusual for philological society because it's going to span philosophy as well as linguistics. So I'll put you through about 20 minutes of philosophy of time before we move to the relevance uh, of uh, tense and tenseless languages uh, and how uh, temporal reference uh, is expressed in these languages for various important questions to do with human time as well as real time. Can you all hear me? Is the microphone working? Okay, great. Um, uh, so, hence my title, Tense and Tenseless Languages for Tenseless Reality. Um, I'm going to uh, look uh, at the importance of uh, languages uh, in uh, addressing these uh, questions. Now, I'll start with something which I just happened to uh, come across a few days ago. Uh, Brennan Joseph's uh, presidential address, LSA presidential address, published in uh, Language, where it's a long article about the importance of time for linguists. Um, he says things like, I quote, humans have always had and continue to have an uneasy relationship with time. Linguists are in a position to take a long view of time and diachrony. Speakers live in what is really an extended uh, present, uh, which is sometimes called specious present, um, and concludes uh, about this tremendous importance uh, of uh, time for the understanding of uh, humanity. Um, the rest of my talk is not going to be on historical linguistics, but uh, everything else pertains uh, to it. Time is incredibly important, and I hope uh, to convince you about that. Uh, so here is the outline of my talk. There will be four parts. In the first part is short. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce the terms time and tense as they are used across the the areas of metaphysics, epistemology, and linguistics, and you will see there will be huge differences. Then part two is quite philosophical, because I'm going to take you all the way from real time of space-time uh, in philosophy of physics uh, to the flow of time on the level at which humans emerge, hence emergentism, the idea of emergentism. Uh, part three, here I move to linguistics proper, um, and. Uh, uh, time, temporal reference, how time is expressed uh, in a variety of languages. Here I'm going, I'm going to show you um, some examples from tensed as well as tenseless languages uh, in view of convincing you that there is a level uh, of semantic content where time doesn't flow, where time is actually modality. And then part four is probably the least important but I included it for completeness for those of you who are interested in formal semantics and pragmatics because I'm going to show that these ideas are also formalizable in the theory of uh, default uh, semantics. So, uh, time and tense, uh, part one. Uh, human time flows. Time flows. We are born, we die, time is the dynamic. We all uh, feel it, experience something of that kind. Uh, but in physics, time doesn't flow. A 
according to most physicists, time doesn't flow. We know it, we've known it for about a hundred years since Einstein and his special theory of relativity that time uh, is dimension or dimensions of uh, space uh, time. So there is this relation here between the metaphysics of time, that is real time as we understand it, and the concept of time as expressed uh, through linguistic expressions uh, in uh, different languages, so concept of time and time flow, and we try to understand this link. It's, it's a very difficult link because philosophers stay here, linguists tend to stay here, and there is this grey area which people, if they tackle, they tackle it either from the philosophical side without having an insight into the into natural languages, because they are philosophers, or linguists uh, tackle it uh, from the perspective of uh, cross-cultural, cross-linguistic differences and perhaps looking for universals, but they don't go uh, further into the metaphysics of real time. So I'm, I hope I'm trying to do something, something quite novel here. Okay, so starting with metaphysics, what is uh, real time? There are two basic theories um, which uh, philosophers adopt here. One is called A theory, pertaining to the so called A series, and this is my very crude illustration here. According to this A theory, time flows. So the, the, um, uh, so the, the future, the past, the present are real. Real time in the world flows. So here you can imagine, you can imagine. Ah, this is the kind of screen. Ah, oh, okay. Um, you can imagine an observer, so this is the present, and events flow from the future into the present and then uh, into the past. Um, so that's this discredited theory uh, now um, uh, in, in uh, philosophy of physics and in, in, in physics. Um, then we have the B theory pertaining to the so called B series, according to which time is static. Time doesn't flow, but what we have is events arranged on a climb with an arrow, so there is still an arrow, uh, and these events are arranged as earlier than or later than. So there is this precedence and following, but no flow. So that's, that's the B series pertaining to B theory. And uh, we owe this distinction uh, to a Cambridge philosopher, John MacTaggart, who well over a hundred years ago wrote this uh, famous article, The Unreality of Time. Um, she, he proposed these two theories, concluding that neither of them really works, because the, for the first one, we would have to assume the flow of time in order to explain the flow of time. And the second time gets rid of the flow, but then can't explain the flow. So basically to trivialize somewhat, uh, he concludes that time is unreal. Uh, this is just the summary um, of what I, what I uh, showed uh, in uh, uh, my uh, figures. I quote, I shall speak of the series of positions running from the far past through the near past to the present, and then from the present to the near future, and the far future as the A series. The series of positions which runs from earlier to later, I shall call the B series, and the contents of the position uh, in time are called uh, events. And then, as I said, he concludes, time is unreal. So, I quote again, why do we believe that events are to be distinguished as past, present, and future? I conceive that the belief arises from distinctions in our own experience. At any moment, I have certain perceptions, so that's the present. I have also the memory of certain other perceptions, that's the past, uh, and the anticipation of others uh, again, so that's the future. The direct perception itself uh, is a mental state, quote, different from the memory of the anticipation of perceptions. So we have psychological time, human time, but uh, not real time, because for, for him time was flow, time was change, and there was no change uh, on that uh, level. Um, okay, he also distinguishes a so-called C theory, which is like B theory but without a narrow. So basically uh, events are arranged on a climb, but uh, time uh, doesn't have a direction. So that's quite a popular theory now as well, uh, and according to which the universe is symmetrical and it just depends on, from, uh, on your perspective, from the perspective from which you look, whether it's the future or the past. If you look in one direction, it's the past and the future, you look in the other 
direction, then it's the opposite. So that's the idea of symmetrical uh, universe uh, C theory. And recently, that's um, gaining grounds in, in philosophy as well. Um, okay, so as I said, the terms time and tense are used in, a, in different ways in these disciplines. Um, I start with tense here. So tense in metaphysics pertains to tensed reality. So A theorists would say reality is tensed, time flows. B theorists would say uh, reality is not tensed, time doesn't flow. So tense doesn't mean grammatical tense, as I will define it later. Uh, so this will be abbreviated in my talk as tense M. A tense L will be grammatical tense, uh, tense in language. Now, time, I've already defined it, but this is just to summarize. I'm going to talk about metaphysical time, which is real time as uh, constructed by humans, but real time, time of the universe. Then time E, with the index E, will stand for epistemological, you can think of it as psychological time, human time. Uh, and time L will be the time in language, uh, linguistic uh, expressions uh, of time. So this will be very important that there will be these different uses of, of, the, of the terms. Right, so we've gone through part one. And now uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that link between the level of real time and the level of human time, uh, making certain assumptions which I find um, uh, I find important. Um, so emergentism. Emergentism is the idea that um, we, there is a level uh, of the universe of the micro laws, laws of physics. And there is also the idea of our human reality, and they are both equally real. A human reality, consciousness, the ego, uh, the sense of personhood, they all emerge at that level, and we have um, real causation, for example, uh, and free will. They are not illusions, but they emerge uh, from that uh, bottom level. So I quote here, from a brilliant book by Janar Ismail, the title is How Physics Makes Us Free, but uh, it's, it's really a book which is accessible to, to everyone and brilliantly written. I quote, the micro laws create the space for emergent systems with robust capabilities for self-governance. This is us, this is us humans, complex systems emergent systems, self-governance. We create our societies, uh, we create our reality. And self-governance involves the creation of an internal point of view on the world, and so it opens up the psychological space for the growth of the self. So we have the self, I'm not quite going, going all the way to Dennett saying consciousness is unreal, but what I want to show you is my assumption will be that uh, uh, this emergentist story uh, works. That is, that we have the level of human consciousness, human societies, basically us as complex systems, which is real, but um, things come into being as if from nowhere, things which you can't find on the uh, level of micro laws uh, of physics. Um, now, um, the other people in philosophy uh, expressed similar ideas uh, in uh, Craig Callender's work. We have flowing time um, being the most sensible explanation of reality that humans come up with. So this is our way of making sense of the world. We, we uh, invent, so to speak, flowing time. And I quote here, time is that direction on the manifold of events in which we can tell the strongest and most informative stories. Um, so time appears to be dynamic because humans make sense of static time in that way, and we have to focus not on the indexicality, dialectic nature of time, um, the, so now, then, and so on, but on the index, indexicality of the thinking agent of the I. We have to think of time as something that we create. So what's the indexical that's important is the, is the I, is the pronouns, and the indexicality or dialectic nature of time uh, is this sort of second order uh, um, indexicality. By the way, I'm going to read quite a lot. I didn't know the lecture was going to record it, so it'll be recorded, so I intended to put this on my Academia website for you to go through at your own pace later, so I put quite a lot on these slides. 
Um, it's going to be on my academia site anyway, as of uh, early next week. Um, okay, uh, so uh, this double level of indexicality, uh, that also means that we can be wrong about time. One can entertain thoughts about oneself from an internal or from an external perspective. Um, what, what does it mean? It means that, for example, when I say or think I have a headache, I can't be wrong. This is the internal perspective and I must be right. If I have a headache, I have a headache. But if I think, uh, looking at what I think is a mirror, that I'm wearing a red dress, it's again an ego thought that say about myself, but I can be mistaken because it may not be a mirror. It may not. It may be a transparent uh, pane of glass, and there is someone on the other side looking a lot like me, wearing a red dress. So this will be this external perspective on the set, um, which is open to what is called immunity, uh, uh, which is uh, which doesn't have the immunity to error from misidentification. So it's only the internal perspective that I have a headache that has this immunity. Now, um, you can find a reflection of it in languages. So when you compare the English constructions, um, I remember doing something with I remember that I did it. Um, then there is a difference. I remember doing it is stronger, sort of immune, whereas I remember that I did it. It may have been my husband who did it, and I just think, misremember. Uh, uh, James Higgins of a brilliant paper about, about these things. Um, so, analogous to this, we have beliefs about time which can be mistaken or not mistaken. So we have this immunity to error um, pertaining to time. Remember I told you earlier that time is the second order dialectic of indexicality, so uh, that uh, will flow, spill over to time as well. Um, and uh, in other words, I'm saying that time is double indexical. Uh, we have an external perspective. For example, I passed my driving test a long time ago, so that will be external perspective, and that is uh, has to be correct. And you have an internal perspective. Um, so here, notice internal, external means something slightly different. Uh, my internal perspective: I wake up in the morning and strongly believe um, that uh, I still haven't passed my test. At the this afternoon. So this is where it can be mistaken. So the, an event can be externally, covertly in the past and internally, overtly in the future. This will become important later. Uh, covertly, overtly means the, the awareness, online awareness. This will become important later when I show you how to uh, formalize all this. Uh, the, uh, so the conclusion from now is that we index time to the ego. So this is what I call meta, meta indexing. Uh, time E is double indexical, the past, the present, and the future as such, not only with respect to the thinking agent uh, as assessed from the external perspective, but also as assessed from the agent's internal perspective. And these two can fall, can fall apart, become part because you can, uh, you, as I said, you can mistake. Uh, there's plenty of uh, uh, evidence for that, plenty of experimentation. Michael Flaherty, for example, um, looked at, at uh, different narratives um, from seven or eight hundred uh, uh, subjects um, and uh, uh, came up with this generalization uh, pertaining to the density of experience. So when uh, time passes quickly, um, when the, the density of experience is um, uh, low and slowly, when it is high, so when you go on holiday, you do a lot in a day, you do a lot of sightseeing, and you wonder how is it possible if it's only in a day, because a lot has passed. Uh, there are also other factors which influence uh, this distortion, um, such as uh, the physical distance between the stimuli, or when you look at, um, let's say, a picture of an event in a scale, so that scale, whether it's uh, when it's not scale and smaller or bigger, then that can affect how you think of time pertaining to that event. And of course emotions, emotions, when you wait uh, for, a, uh, for a dental appointment and time for drugs, and something pleasant, time flies, and so on. Um, so, now what does it tell us about this relation that I um, pointed out at the beginning between the real time um, of space-time and human time. 
because we want to we want to look at similarities and basically why is it that they are both tiny they are so different um, now the idea how my methodology is this um, it is possible to conceptually dissociate dynamic perspectival time from the A series. So we can say, okay, A series is wrong, real time doesn't flow, B series is right, Einstein is right, of course, um, but human time flows. So they are very, very different, and really there is not much to say. There is there's just this emerging level of human reality, and time means something very different. But it seems that the onus of proof is on those who want to dissociate time in that way. Um, rather than on, the, on convergentists who want to look for similarities. So taking metaphysical time and epistemological time to be both static or both dynamic um, will help, will preempt the need to explain the incompatibility. So let's look, uh, let's take it as a, my methodological assumption and look at um, the feas feasibility of uh, such uh, uh, such a stance and such an explanation. So basically, here you have the combinations, and my answer is going to be that both real time and human time, uh, as um, expressed in natural languages, are inherently static on some level of semantic conceptual representation. <coughs> will uh, be uh, static. After all, it's not unquestionable that we think that time really passes. When you think of it, um, a special theory of relativity has been percolating to popular science, popular awareness for a very long time. Einstein himself wrote this beautiful little book about relativity, which is a bit of it uh, quite easy to understand. And then we, uh, we have brilliant popularizers like Carlo Rovelli, for example. Um, so we have this increasing awareness of uh, Einstein's theory. Also, we don't really observe any absolute direction of time flow. We don't see time um, um, flowing, moving. We, if, if we did, we would be able to say, how quickly does it flow? One second per second, what does it mean? We can't tell. Um, also, directions such as the past is behind us, the future is ahead, are culturally imprinted. So we have languages in which the past is behind us, languages in, in, in which the past is in front of us, it's in front of our eyes because it's already known and the future is behind. So that varies uh, from culture uh, to culture. So the experience of the interval is also subjective and it's recognized as such. All in all, uh, there are problems with this big assumption that we experience the flow uh, of uh, time. So, um, if it is problematic, so then where exactly does this dynamicity come, come from? Where exactly does this flow come from? And how crucial is dynamicity to human beliefs um, about time? These are really big questions. Okay, now I go back to Jenna Ismail, just to show you that uh, philosophers don't address this problem. The apparent conflict between the familiar flowing time of everyday experience, I quote here, and the static time of the block universe, block universe and static universe, has a stubborn way of reasserting itself as a substantive and all important metaphysical disagreement, she calls it. Even in my, own, in my own mind, it is a reminder of a constant tension in the human between the transcendent and embedded viewpoints, which is uh, in its uh, turn, the product of a peculiarly human form of mindedness. Now, I, I don't think so. I think we can go further than that. It's not just metaphysical disagreement and constant tension. We are, we are more clever than that. Um, now, look at my two examples. Time is just a dimension of static space-time. The universe is governed by symmetrical laws. Do we understand it? Yes and no. We sort of understand it, but since we are lay people, we are not physicists, astrophysicists, we don't really, really understand it. So this is what Dan Sperber, uh, the same one from Sperber and Wilson and Relevance, but he also has his own work as a, a separate work as an uh, anthropologist. This is what Dan Sperber calls semi-propositional uh, beliefs, beliefs which are just 
semi-understood. We put them in quotes, so to speak, uh, hoping that maybe sometime in the future we'll understand them. <laughs> we trust the source, but we don't really fully understand them. So this is what happens with time. We don't, we don't really understand uh, what it is, but we trust the sources. So semi-propositional beliefs are reflective, they are reflective, they are not intuitive, we are aware of holding them, um, and they tend to be popular representations of scientific representation of uh, reality. So this is what uh, Sperber calls meta-representation. Um, so we, we had uh, this uh, meta-indexical uh, nature of time, now we have another meta, we have meta-representation. So that's, that's the first step, or maybe the second step, to understanding that link. First we had time as index to the ego, and now we have this meta-representation, putting things in quotes, showing that what's happening between these two levels is not quite clear, but we are really trying to get to the bottom of it as humans. So the conception of a static block universe has the status of a semi-propositional and presentational belief. Okay, so let's start writing it down as equations instead of this uh, stubborn, whatever it was called in the quotation, uh, stubborn uh, conflict. Uh, let's see uh, how, how far we can, we can go. So we have human time equals putting metaphysical time in quotes. Uh, so time flows. We have to put time doesn't flow in quotes and try to understand uh, that uh, equation. So, there is no better place to go for that than the way we speak, the way we speak in a variety of uh, human languages. So let's now just move to that, to expressions of temporality in different languages, and see how much we can infer about our concept of time from the way uh, we speak. We are in part three now. In English, of course, we have grammatical tenses in combination with uh, aspect, and we also have temporal uh, adverbials. Plenty of them, we use them uh, amply. And uh, here I'm sure the definition is not needed for this audience, but the language is tense when it contains grammaticalized expressions that stand for temporal reference, but they have to be absolute rather than relative. This is important. So the coding time has to be the uh, default dialectic center. Then we also have tenseless languages, plenty of them. Here are just a few examples uh, Yucatec Maya, Mandarin Chinese, Paraguayan Guarani, and so on, um, which um, tend to make use of aspect and mood markers, uh, modality, evidentiality markers, and uh, temporal or sometimes nothing, just pragmatic inference from context, and sometimes just relying on default meanings, uh, defaults usually pertaining to the current uh, moment um, and departures from default in the of the future for the past. Um, so here are a few examples. Yucatec Maya has very little overt uh, time marking, uh, not many um, expressions of ordering, such as after or while, um, but it has plenty of aspect mood markers, such as uh, aspect terminative, progressive, prospective, uh, or mood uh, necessity uh, I need. And here notice that we have the same expression for I need, needed, will need to read the paper. So what's foregrounded is the mood rather than the temporal location of the eventuality, eventuality meaning event state of process. Um, oh, desiderative is another example. I want, want it, will want to read the paper. Again, what's foregrounded is the mood, not the temporal location, and that's really telling. Um, then we also have expressions of temporal distance, uh, so this will be this, this, this will be the relative for the problem of something happened happened or will happen uh, within a short distance or medium or long distance, but we are not told whether this distance goes into the past or into the uh, future. This is what I usually call lexicon grammar pragmatics trades off because we have to remember that all languages can express uh, the thoughts equally well, they just do it 
uh, using different devices, sometimes just pragmatic devices in the context. So here are a few examples um, from Yukatek Maya, uh, uh, from Jürgen Bonemeyer. Uh, I am, was, will be going to read the paper. They all pertain to the same construction with a, a prospective uh, marker. Uh, I have had, will have almost read the paper. Um, again, the same construction uh, with the uh, proximate uh, marker and immediate similarly I have had, will have just read the paper. Just, so this is the immediate, but it's not foregrounded whether it happened or uh, will, will happen. Um, okay, so here we have some more. I read, had read, will have read. I read uh, the paper a short time ago, so we have uh, here uh, the uh, recent uh, aspect of marker and remote uh, for I read, had read, will have read uh, a long time ago. Okay, the same, uh, the same story. So we have proximate relative future, immediate relative past, for example, uh, recent relative past, remote not absolute distinctions are foregrounded. Uh, Paraguay and Guarani, another tenseless language, um, only temporal adverbials and context uh, are used to mark temporal reference, uh, aspect, modality, and mode can be grammatically marked, and then we have also uh, default uh, interpretations. Uh, by the way, um, these, uh, this would be a, a really, really tense, tenseless language. Uh, as some of you will know, in, in genetic linguistics, there have been attempts to, uh, to analyze tenseless languages uh, as having covered tense, but not, not all languages uh, fall uh, under this analysis. Some are, some are, so to speak, more tenseless than others. Um, another example, West Greenlandic, an Eskimo language. We have, uh, again, mood markers combined with aspect, present or past time reference combined through factual moods, such as introducing, presupposing, inquiring about facts, uh, then uh, uh, aspect and uh, context uh, added for further disambiguation. So the future is rendered by prospective markers, be likely, begin, um, uh, and uh, uh, or let us. This, this will be uh, the closest you can get to futurity. Hausa is interesting. Uh, Chadic Afroasiatic language, uh, we have she is, was, will be playing, uh, all pertaining to the construction with continuous uh, aspect. They have, will have repaired the car. Here you have uh, completed. But what's interesting, that was brilliantly written about by Anna Muha, uh, is that there is the so called, what she calls the hierarchy of simplicity. Um, so sentences with continuous aspect are by default interpreted as having present time reference uh, and with completive aspect as the past. It seems common sense, but then, so you, but, but this is the default from which you can depart. So the default will be no dis displacement, the present time reference, past will be temporal displacement and future temporal and modal. So there is a, uh, future comes last because the displacement is the greatest, that's her analysis uh, of uh, the situation in the house. Okay, so what I wanted to show from these examples is that in tenseless languages, something else is foregrounded. What's foregrounded uh, is, um, is the, not the location in the past, uh, the present, or the future, but something else, such as the source of, of evidence, such as remoteness, um, something more pertaining to the person, to the speaker, to the audience, uh, rather than absolute uh, distinction, um, which you can then map onto a, a timeline. Now I'm moving to languages in which tense and aspect are optional. So my example here is Thai, uh, a sentence uh, from talk can mean all sorts of things. It's raining, it was raining, it will be raining, it might rain, probably about 20 different things. Um, example um, uh, analyzed in detail by Jelantra Suotai. Um, another example from her um, with uh, a marker, model marker, die. Sometimes people thought it was analyzed as, as, as 
this temporal marker of the past, but it proved to be just a model marker, uh, which uh, pertains to was able to uh, or can. Um, uh, and again, the temporality is, is open uh, here. So we have default interpretations, departures from default, um, and modality being foregrounded rather than, uh, rather than uh, tense. Okay, you would think that English would be simpler because we have grammatical tenses, everything is clear. Well, not really so. Um, let, uh, let us look at the past. There are many different ways uh, of uh, uh, representing pastness. There is regular past. I read Danga last week. Uh, by the way, if you don't know the book, I, I use this example because it's a brilliant book, Down Girl, The Logic of Misogyny by a philosopher, Kate Mann. I really recommend it. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. It's just a digression, but it's, it's, it's a brilliant book. Um, uh, so, we have regular past. Then we have the use of the present, so vivid present, or past of narration. This is what happened yesterday. I'm reading Down Girl, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then we have uh, the use uh, of models, I would have finished, uh, I must have finished, uh, um, I may have been reading, I might have been reading. Um, these are also ways of representing pastness, but they are weaker. So what interests me here, and that bit pertains to the work I did quite a few years ago, so this is not new, um, it's my book Representing Time, I published in 2009 when I looked at temporality as modality. What interests me here is the fact that you can, um, you can talk about past states and events with different degree of commitment, of epistemic commitment. You can use regular past or past of narration with which you express strong commitment. It really happened. And then uh, you go uh, weaker and weaker. It's attenuated through epistemic necessity past to epistemic possibility past somewhere um, away from uh, one uh, towards zero. So even in English you can see modality is really, really important. It sort of underpins uh, temporality. It's this reference to us and our own um, perception uh, and experience uh, of, of that event. First person, first person, second, or, or first hand, second hand, and so on. So, hence, um, I developed here this idea of time as dependent on epistemic modality. Uh, definitionally de dependent, conceptually dependent, this is what philosophers call supervenience. Supervenience meaning definitional dependence. Um, so temporal properties here supervene on model properties. Supervenience of the concept of time on the concept of epistemic detachment. So we have evidence for that from tenseless languages, from languages where time um, expression of temporality, uh, tense and aspect is optional, as well as fully uh, tense languages uh, such as English. The modality, epistemic modality, and this uh, I is very, very important. So uh, the degree of remoteness or current relevance or degree of certainty can be lexically or grammatically marked in preference to absolute reference. Okay, um, so where are we now? We are, we have just looked at immense cross-linguistic diversity in expressing uh, time, but that doesn't mean that we have to stay there with this relativity uh, and diversity. We can go further and now look at something um, more lying in between that level of real time and the huge diversity in languages and look for um, a possible level uh, of universal human concepts and just to check if it's, if it's possible to bring down this relativity uh, to uh, such a level of uh, universal human concepts. If we fail, we fail. If we don't, we don't. I don't think we'll fail. So, let's start with that. We have levels of concepts. Um, we just looked at sentences, utterances, where forms of temporal reference employed in natural languages give us a window on the human concept of time. But we have to remember that they only give us a window on what we can call online thinking, uh, not on the ultimate properties of temporal concepts. 
Um, so they give us a window on what Dan Slobin would call thinking for speaking. But it's also possible to construct human concept of time as a complex concept and assume that maybe if we de delve deeper, we can find uh, a level of basic concepts, not thinking for speaking, but basic in thinking, which uh, are universal. So thinking for speaking or what uh, uh, Steve Levinson uh, calls experiencing for thinking, where he looked at examples, the John Lewis's examples, um, differences such as well, in English we say bottle plant and pancake, in UK the Maya we say plastic wood maze, so the, the, the classification would be by uh, the substance rather than by the function. And yet we can look delve deeper uh, to uh, the level of uh, some conceptual building blocks because these are often complex concepts rather than primitive atomic or subatomic uh, building blocks. Um, so, what Levinson did for space, I'm trying to adapt here a little bit for time. Uh, also, the idea of neo worthiness universals in the conceptualization of time are not to be found on the level of linguistic semantics. No extant semantic account generalizes to all tenseless languages. And here, I already mentioned the attempts, uh, like uh, Elisa Mathewson, um, where we can't find covered um, tense for explanation for all of those languages on my list, just for some. Um, but uh, these universals uh, are to be found on the level of conceptual building blocks. So somewhere, so these atoms out of which the conceptual molecules are composed. So we think on the level of molecules and we are looking for that level of atoms or subatomic levels. So as I said, Levinson did it for space and spatial relations, looking at huge diversity and then looking at checking whether they can be brought to a common denominator, such as spatial prepositions, for example, at positions, for example, and I look at it for temporal reference. Um, now, we can combine it with where we have just got to, after looking at different languages, that time uh, can be analyzed as epistemic modality, degrees of commitment. Time as a graded commitment to events uh, and uh, as such, a time as a model epistemic concept. So we are almost there because we could see that, that that aspect of time as modality is there across the board in tensed and tenseless languages. Uh, this is important everywhere. So events can be understood uh, uh, or remembered to different degrees. They can also be anticipated more or less strongly. Inference about events can be monotonic or non-monotonic, uh, reliable, not reliable, uh, in logical terms, and as such be more or less uh, trustworthy. And the concept of time rests on building blocks that mark such degrees of commitment, the degrees to which we are prepared to endorse statements about the past, the present, and the future. So this modality gives us the level of such uh, building blocks. Hence, we don't have to rest with that uh, linguistic or cultural diversity. We don't have to uh, end up with a concept uh, of time uh, so e, time E pertaining to a language uh, X. So time E or time L pertaining to a language uh, X. Uh, this uh, is not the end point. While on the surface languages display significant cross-linguistic variation, this uh, variation is only there on the level of those uh, molecules, not on the level of conceptual uh, building blocks. Putting it together, um, the concept of time on all three levels appears as an emergent property um, on the uh, higher uh, molecular level of human uh, concepts. It doesn't flow on the level of conceptual building blocks. So here we are with the static time, this is what I promised you. It doesn't flow on that level of semantic conceptual building blocks. It flows only on the level uh, of the molecular combinations, so these species-specific thoughts and their culture and language-specific expressions. So when you think of that arrow I showed on my first slide uh, between uh, reality and the emergent human reality, then and what happens in between um, and I said that in my methodology uh, the convergentist swing so you have to is, if 
you can't show that they, they both have similar properties, they both flow or they both don't flow, then that's a preferable um, explanation. Uh, this is what I got here. I'm not saying it's true, but I'm saying that looking at evidence from different languages, this is a possible explanation, that there is this level of human um, concept of time at which time doesn't flow, but it's something pertaining to our, our um, um, epistemic model uh, attitude. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, that's really the main part of my talk. I'm going to whiz very quickly through the semantic representation. You can sleep if you want, but if you're interested in a um, more formal uh, aspect of this, uh, then uh, just bear with me for another few minutes. This is not a long section. Right. Um, remember that equation, time n, time e. Now, if we want to represent it, we need some kind of operator taking us from real time, metaphysical time, to human time, psychological time, epistemological time. Uh, in philosophy, Giuliano Torengo, a brilliant philosopher from Milan, uh, came up with the idea of primitive phenomenal modifier. Um, I'm just going to use the idea of an operator, not a phenomenal modifier, because first of all I'm talking about concept of time, not phenomenology, and also for me it's not primitive, as you could see, it's, 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 it's molecular, and we have atoms. So, uh, I'm quoting him because the idea of, of the equation is from him, but for me this operator is something very different. And here, remember, when I talked about this being mistaken about oneself, I've been mistaken about time. I'm coming back to this now uh, and using uh, this as part of my operator. So we have subjective overt qualifiers. So our experience, our feeling, time passes slowly, time seems to fly. That is the subjective overt qualifier. Um, then we have objective covert qualifier, the sort of, so to speak, reality of time as others see it. So time m, real time, um, will be embedded uh, in this OCQ, which will again be embedded um, in uh, uh, COQ. Uh, and as I said, overt and covert uh, uh, refer to online awareness. So we are beginning to understand that equation, that link here. Um, and again, remember that quotation from Jenna and Ismail that we have the apparent inherent inconsistency. This is what emergentists tell us, that there is just nothing we can do. We, can, we are emergent, complex systems. We are different. Reality is different. Well, not so. We can go much further if we delve into our human languages. Uh, now, I'm moving all this to the level of beliefs, not just feelings, experience, phenomenology like philosophers do. So here is my concept of time. Uh, when you take all this, this is the concept of time. Uh, and since this is a complex concept, then of course we all want to know its composition. Hence I took you through all this story about time being modality. And notice once we have this, then we can apply that to concepts such as past, present, future. This will follow um, analogously. All right, so again, we have a real time. Uh, this is our human time, and all this is the concept of time uh, here. Um, we, and, and this bit is a bit complicated, but that's again it's an old story. It's something I developed in that book, Representing Time, in 2009, where time in semantic representation uh, can be rendered as degrees of acceptability. Remember my degrees of modality or epistemic modality. So here I have an operator. It is acceptable to the degree n that it is the case at, at that sigma. Sigma is my kind of proposition. It's a proposition, it's not a sentence. It's a contextualist proposition, more like Sperber and Wilson's uh, explicature, but going even further than that in my theory of default semantics. So, uh, for example, regular past. Uh, I read uh, um, uh, the book. Um, uh, down girl. Uh, it is acceptable to the degree pertaining to regular past that it is the case that sigma. So that will be, um, this is the, uh, the, the way I rewrite the concept of time on this side uh, of the equation. By the way, acceptability operator is borrowed from Grice, from his uh, brilliant, unfinished and uh, not very well known book, book aspects of reason where he tried to bring all kinds of modality to one type 
uh, under acceptability, but he used it in a somewhat different way in two propositions. So again, I adapted from uh, from Price. Um, and then I have representations in my theory of default semantics, which some of you will be familiar with. Uh, it's a, it is a contextualist uh, semantic approach, it's a truth conditional semantics, but not sentence based uh, like traditional semantics, but uh, pertaining uh, to uh, thoughts, utterances, so enriched, enriched sentences or sentences which then give rise to thoughts expressed indirectly. But um, true, it's still truth conditional uh, and it is uh, formalized in a uh, version uh, of viscous representation theory. So these uh, representations collect information from different sources of information. That's just, uh, that's not crucial for my talk. I just put it here for completeness since these slides are going to be uh, online. Uh, so these are uh, the um, types of processes I recognize and then pertain to different sources of information and my representations combine information coming from these sources. So not just from the sentence, but also uh, from inference in context, from defaults, sociocultural defaults, uh, and so on. And uh, this is what my representations look like. So, I chose this one because I can show you here that there is no problem in this theory to represent uh, tense time mismatches. So, I will have, I go to London tomorrow. Uh, go tomorrow, no problem, because you have different sources of information, so you have different bits of the proposition in square brackets, then the index pertains to type of process, so where the cognitive default for proper names, uh, word meaning sentence structure for the sentence, as well as conscious pragmatic inference, which gives you uh, the future uh, in spite of the grammatical form uh, go. Uh, so these are my sigmas, the uh, representations. Then you can do the same for tenseless languages, um, because uh, uh, you can combine here these different um, processes that give you the proposition. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but uh, you can uh, go through this uh, in your own time if you are interested. And I'm going to leave you, I think I have literally like two minutes, I shouldn't speak for longer than that. I'm going to leave you with a big question because, of course, what is it that we want to represent in a theory, in a semantic theory like that? Is it, we are not representing sentences anymore, we are representing primary meanings as conveyed by the speaker, by the writer. Um, so, what do we, where do we end? Uh, okay, so here is another interesting example of a, a language with, uh, which um, uh, David Flagg calls, has, what he calls double tense. So, it's, uh, it's uh, Matsis, uh, uh, Panoan uh, language from uh, the Amazon uh, region. The sentence is this, non Matsis Indians had made a hut. The tense is this, distance past inferential, recent past experiential. So, that's just uh, this one form which, is, which has this double uh, meaning, hence he, hence he calls it double, double tense. And all this is overt there, grammaticalized in this sentence. Um, now, when you look at the, uh, at the English, okay, so that just summarizes this information. When you look at the English equivalent, imagine, uh, so here you had uh, non-Matsis Indians had made a hut. Imagine um, looking at a villa and saying the Romans built this villa. That would be a close equivalent. But we don't have all this information that we have in Matsis. So how much do we want to represent? Do we just represent a simple past tense? Or do we want to go into the thoughts of the speaker and do more? Well, we can do both. We can have a simple representation, uh, the Romans built this villa, uh, or we can have a representation uh, in which we also add conscious pragmatic inference, cultural defaults, and all that that my default semantics accounts for, where we know that the speaker has just seen this villa, but the speaker knows that this villa had been built a long time ago by the Romans. And we can represent that uh, as well. Um, what we want to do is an open question, uh, and uh, that's um, not the subject of this talk. So, my last two slides. Summing up, time flows on the emergent level of the ego perspective, and this flow is explained through the combination of uh, those interrelated exponentia, the emergent meta-indexical ego perspective, remember it's the I and then time being sort of 
attached to that. Then meta-representational, semi-propositional nature of beliefs about time. Remember, we put it in quotes for further understanding. We don't fully understand time. Uh, and then dynamic with an asterisk, because it's not quite like dynamic, time in uh, languages as a complex concept, uh, which is uh, reanalyzable into static conceptual uh, building blocks, which are model epistemic uh, model in nature. And as I showed, they uh, also have their formal representations in uh, default semantics. So this universal static conceptual semantic building, the, the, these uh, building blocks uh, help explain the apparent conflict between, uh, I quote here again from Ismail, the apparent conflict between the familiar flowing time of everyday experience and the static time of the block universe. It's not really a conflict with which we end. It's something to explore, and I hope I just explored it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.